for today, we are looking at the uh, letter to the church at Laodicea as we read in Revelation chapter 3 and beginning at verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now let me point out once again that all of these letters, with the exclusion of the first one, the first letter was to the church at Ephesus, and that's where the story begins, if you will. But all of the subsequent letters, and today all the way up to number seven, begin with the word and. It's really one long, continuous uh, letter that is written to all the churches everywhere, world with out in. So, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen. Now that's a capital A as it addresses a person. It's a personal pronoun. It's speaking about the Lord Jesus. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with good and I have need of nothing, and because thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee, because all of this was true in many of their lives, not all, but in many of their lives, he says, I counsel thee. Do you know one of the uh, titles of the Lord Jesus is the uh, wonderful counselor? He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesight salve, that thou might mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Pause. Now, this is the most critical letter of the seven. And, and you often hear about the church at Laodicea and what terrible condition they were in. And all of that is true. But I want you to notice what Jesus said about them. You see that first line? Isn't that something? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him, and he with me, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sit down with my, fa with my father in his throne. Now, before I come to the next slide, the next slide contains a verse that appears uh, at least seven times in the book of Revelation. It appears uh, in Christ's teachings in the gospel. It appears in the book of Acts. Here is the last time the phrase ever appears in the Bible. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this another privilege to call on your name. And we thank you, dear God, even for the reading of your word this morning. And when we slow down, not just to try to read through it, but when we slow down and let it soak in just a little bit, why it absolutely becomes the living word within us. We pray that you'd help us this morning as we study. And for all that's accomplished, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, amen. amen and amen. Now on your worksheets this morning, 
Uh, you will find, uh, I think there's four red lines pretty early on. It's going to take me five or maybe seven minutes to get there. The introduction to this lesson is a little bit lengthy because it is the last uh, of the seven letters. And today uh, we're looking at the seventh letter or the, uh, to the churches of Revelation. Along the way we saw the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamos, the church at Thyatira, the church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, and today we'll be looking at the church at Laodicea. Now one of the things that has really struck me this week as I have studied this particular letter, and I'll say again, I've been doing this for 30 years now, and this is the first time that I have ever taught through the book of Revelation and would not be doing so now if I did not feel definitely persuaded of the Lord uh, to do so. But one of the things that has really uh, uh, came out to me in this study of these letters is how they run the emotional or the spiritual gamut, if you will. We saw the largest of the churches with the greatest potential squander that opportunity. And we saw the smallest of the churches rise to accomplish great things for his honor and glory. The song said, little is much when God is in it. So we saw the largest of the churches squander their opportunity. We saw the smallest of the churches rise to accomplish great things for the honor and glory of God. We saw the wealthiest of the churches grow enamored with the things uh, of the world. It was that great missionary Jim Elliott. I know you remember uh, uh, that name, Diane. That great missionary uh, Jim Elliott that said, Lord, don't allow the fire in my bones to be put out by the asbestos of other things. This is not in my notes uh, in, anywhere. In Matthew 6, 33, the Lord Jesus said, Seek first uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. So we saw the largest church squander their opportunity. The smallest church accomplished the greatest things. Isn't it often that way? We saw the wealthiest church become enamored with the things of the world. The poorest of the church actually was the most benevolent of the seven. It reminded me of Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 7 and, and 8, where we hear Lemuel, uh, which we believe to be just another name for Solomon. But at any rate, we hear Lemuel praying in Proverbs chapter 30, Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches, lest I be full and deny thee, or lest I be poor and take your name in vain. Isn't that, isn't that something? What really brings all this stuff, these highs and lows, or I said how they run the emotional or spiritual gamut, these letters are a little bit like a spiritual roller coaster, if you will. And what brings it up at this point is last week at the church at Philadelphia, we saw his highest level of commendation, not a critical word one. Uh, last week, in the uh, letter with the highest level of, of, of commendation, we were there at the Philadelphia, the church at Philadelphia. Today, we'll see the church with the highest level of criticism. And ironically, and perhaps the greatest paradox in all of the Bible, it is to this church, <clears throat> it is to this church whom the Lord says, now, it's not translated this way in the King James Version. In many other translations, it is. So I, I don't often do this, but I'll borrow a quote from another translation. It is to this church that the Lord says, You make me, anybody make me sick. That's what the phrase, I will spew you out of my mouth. The word spew literally means to vomit. Uh, what he's saying is, You turn my stomach. Y'all people are doing it's not the people themselves, but what uh, that they were doing. So we find the highest level of criticism to any of the churches written to 
to the church uh, at uh, Laodicea. Uh, but again, ironically, almost amazingly, it is to that same church that the friends, the greatest invitation in all of the Bible is given to the church at Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door. And he's still standing at the door, knocking. And he said, if we'll open the door, he will come in. Now, I'm almost up to the lesson probably It's taking longer than seven minutes, isn't it? And many of you know that I preach a lot of funerals. Just uh, last month, the month uh, of September, actually the second half of August and the first half of, of, of September, in that four-week stretch, I did 20 funerals in a four-week stretch. And I've always done a lot of funerals, but that's probably the most in a four-week stretch uh, that I have it, 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 ever done. And, and when I do funerals, most of you all have heard me uh, officiate or conduct uh, funerals. And when I do funerals, uh, my primary goal is to minister to the family, not to be blind or to sound morbid or anything, but there's really nothing I can do for the deceased. Uh, my job at that point, as I see it, is to strive to minister uh, to the family. Now, lately, I'm going somewhere with this. Lately, I, I have seen the largest crowds at funerals that I have ever seen. I believe, Skeeter, it is because everybody is hurting. So they're rallying around one another. They're just yeah. wanting to be there. To, I believe that's what it, it, it's all about. But wait a minute. The largest crowds of all and, and the greatest and the greatest movement of the Spirit of God uh, uh, of all of these funerals that I've been doing have been for people that by all accounts, now I don't preach anybody into heaven or into hell, okay? And that's not what I'm doing now. But the greatest movement of the Spirit of God that I have seen at funerals recently has been for the funerals of people who by all accounts have not made a profession of faith. And I want you to know it's like God saying, I'm begging you. H.A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ironside. I'll get to it. H.A. Ironside. How many knows who that was? A uh, great Bible commentator from yesteryear. He pastored the church that D.L. Moody founded. Okay? H.A. Uh, Ironside in his commentary of the gospel according to John, in chapter 19, I've got it, if anybody would ever want to look at it, but in chapter, chapter 19, in that commentary, is titled, Is There a Second Chance After Death? And he begins by unequivocally stating no, and uses much scripture to document that. But then he goes on, and it's the story of the thief on the cross. He said, here's a man that has lived his entire life as a thief, and now he is being put to death because of the life that he has lived. Do you remember not his prayer? Uh, the other one, the other, the other thief uh, uh, cursed the Lord uh, 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 Jesus, and the thief on the cross, the repentant thief, and said, we're receiving what we deserve. That's right. That shows something about him right there, doesn't it? It, it shows a, an idea of humility or, or prince or repentance and even uh, uh, at, at, at that point. But there, the, the thief, H.A. Uh, Ironside asked, I wonder if his mother was close enough to hear him pray with his life's breath. Wow. I'm the one that believes as long as there's breath, there's hope. And I'm hanging, right. I'm hanging my hat on it. But again, Amen. here, I, I'll tell you this, I'll get to the lesson. Okay, this idea of him standing at the door and knocking is what's bringing, and I believe he still is, don't you? Yeah. Pleading. I rarely ever, I believe I can count them on my hands after 30 years of doing this, I rarely ever rear back and 
preach at a funeral. I did a funeral recently during that four-week stretch. And we had a little gathering in Loomis in Popka, but the main service was a graveside service on Claricona, Oakway Road in Forano Memorial Garden. Skeeter, you know who I'm talk talking about. It's one of the biggest crowds I've ever seen in a graveyard. Uh, there was at least 250 people there. And driving from the pocket down to Taracona, uh, Ocoa Road, the Lord gave, gave me a thought, uh, the fourth man in the fire. And I stood there and preached in the graveyard, and the Spirit of God just filled that place. I said, I stood there. That's not entirely accurate. I was on my knees beside the grave. Preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost as God's Lord. Please, please open the door. Yeah. And the letter to the church. If we don't get nothing else, that's pretty good, ain't it? In the letter to the church at Laodicea, we will see the dynamic Christ. That's sort of what we've been illustrating already, the dynamic Christ. Now, as you're writing that, sometimes that term dynamic is used uh, in conjunction, I'm not being immodest, in a preacher like myself or John uh, with a fireball. Uh, it, 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 if you will, a dynamic uh, speaker, it, it, if you will. It does not necessarily mean a loud, but it means a preacher that just reaches out and gets a hold of you. That's the kind of preacher Christ was. Not necessarily loud, but the not dynamic Christ. Secondly, we see the deluded church. Let me move quickly now. The deluded church. The dynamic Christ, the deluded church. Third, a definite choice. They made a definite choice. And finally, I'll let you write that. And finally, the letter ends with a dual challenge. A challenge, uh, this is not under your hand out yet, it will be a while. A challenge both to the sinner and to the saint. We will begin our study proper today with the dynamic Christ. As in verse 14 we read, These things saith the Amen. I want you to notice in verse 14 that he introduces himself first as the Amen. It is the only time, the best I can tell, in the Bible uh, that this word is used as a name, as a personal pronoun. And he introduces him first as the Amen. It means he is the one who has had the one that uh, has even now and will always have the final say. Yes. It began with him. It will end with him. So once again, he is the one who has had, has and always will have the final say. He is the amen. Secondly, he introduces himself as the faithful and true witness. Again, it means similarly the same thing. He is the one who is, uh, always has been, and always will be. That is all covered. If it was in parentheses, it's not. Uh, but if you want to get that is all covered in the idea of faithful and true. He is the one that always has been, is, and always will be the faithful and true witness. 
He is the embodiment of faithfulness and truth and the guarantor. I like that word. That's a B.R. Lincoln word. The guarantor of all the promises of God. First, in 2 Corinthians 1 20. All the promises of God in him are yea. It means you can take it to the bank. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Now in the book of Genesis, this is brief, but in the book of Genesis, he was faithful to Abraham when it seemed like they wasn't no way. Abraham was a hundred years old. You don't really expect me to believe it. You know, there's no indication of anything like that. Not from Abraham, anyway. Abraham's wife. A little, what was her name? Sarah. 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 A little bit. A little, little bit. What did Sarah do? <laughs> That's nonsense. But God was faithful. He said, this time next year, You'll hear little footsteps in the house. Isn't that amazing? For a hundred-year-old man and a ninety-year-old woman, that's more amazing yet, isn't it? He was faithful to Abraham. Watch this develop. He was faithful to Moses as he stood there on the banks of the Red Sea. No way. Do you see a pattern? No. No. Absolute. All the promises of God. In him are yea, and in him are a. The Bible said three times something to that, but the Bible said three times there have not failed one word of all his good uh, promises. So we see that he and has been, is, and always will be the faithful and true witness. Third, he introduces himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Now, of these three titles in this last introduction, introduction to the last letter, I should say, this is the only one that has been used before. The beginning of the creation of uh, 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 God. It's the only one we have seen before, and it means he's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and, and, and the ending. The one who is dead and behold is alive forevermore. He was there in eternity past and he will still be there when time comes to an end. And eternity resumes. Do you realize that right now since Genesis 1 and through Revelation 22, it's like God pushed Paul's button on eternity. Now, eternity has no end or beginning, but time has both. Time began in the book of Genesis, and as we continue on in our study, we will find that time will end. Eternity, no, but time will end. My father, he, you know, me and my daddy, he wore a Timex wristwatch his whole life. I've got a Timex wristwatch on. Daddy never wore one like this. It always had that silver, stretchy band, you know. That's the kind of watch he wore his whole, whole life. I wish I'd thought about it sooner. Uh, uh, he, he died at 853 on July the 23rd, 1999. I wish I'd thought to stop his watch. I know it seems strange. But on a Wednesday night, at 8.53, on July, excuse me, June the 23rd, 1999, for God, Dad, time stopped. And eternity began. In the book of Genesis, time began. And in the book of Revelation, Time will end. As for now, watch this come around. The 
hole. I stand at the door. In Acts 17 and verse 28, the Bible said, it is in him that we live and move and have our being. Colossians 1 perhaps sums it up the best. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 19. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, son, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Pause just a second. The word consist means to continue to exist. He's the one that started this thing, and he's the one that keeps it going. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the, anybody, preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Therefore, we conclude that he is our dynamic Christ, number two, excuse me, not just yet, we see a deluded church. That's in verses 15 through 17, where he said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I, I would that you was. I would that you uh, were either cold or, or hot, but because that you're lukewarm, you make me sick. That's something, isn't it? Yeah. Because... I'll tell you once again, anytime you see that word in the Bible, you need to stop. Because God is being very precise with the word because. Well, you know what made him sick? He says here, because you say, I'm rich and I don't need nothing. That's what made him. You don't even know that you're wretched. We studied about this, not in this book, but in the book of Romans. Wins, wins. Now, William McDonald, my favorite Bible commentator, says this speaks of their sickening compromise. Notice the idea, sickening, makes God sick, if you will. The word sickening in the King James uh, Version is the word spew. I already went over this. The word spew means to vomit. So it's sickening. But what I really want you to see, I want you to take, take off the prefix. Okay? I want you to take off. Sorry. Oops. I didn't do that. Huh? And take, take off the prefix. And what are you left with? Promise. The prefix means to negate or to turn back upon. You turn back when you promise. Now remember he's talking to Christian people. Remember those that remember? You turn back on your promise. I'll not tell you the story for time's sake. But God spoke to my heart and said, remember what you promised me. I tell folks, I should tell folks, we may forget about those promises. Be sure. God does not. McDonald pointed out there's sickening compromise. Secondly, there's sickening complacency. This is worse yet. Not only had they gone back on their promises to God, but they were okay with it. Yeah. It'll come up again in a little bit, but don't. Do you remember when Delilah cut Samson's hair? The, ha the strength was never in the hair, by the way. The, the strength is what the, was found in what the hair represented, and that was a promise, a covenant that Samson had entered into with God. So when, the, when he laid down there and let Delilah cut his hair, he broke the covenant that he had made with God. And that's what happened to the power in his life. But Delilah cut his hair 
And said, Samson, the Philistines are here. And Samson awoke, watch this, and quoting directly from Scripture, and knew not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. How in the world can a man have the Spirit of God leave him and not even realize it? Just a little bit. My, I've got to hurry. My pastor, Larry Hall, was a biology teacher in the public school system, Blountville. And Larry Hall taught me one time, he said, you can take a frog and put him in a bucket of water on the stove and slowly turn the heat up and that frog will stay in there until he cooks himself to death. He said, if you drop that same frog in a hot bottle bucket of water, he'll jump right out. But they slowly, but slowly, and ever so slowly, Samson And so did the Laodiceans, by the way. So we see, we see their sickening compromise. More importantly, their sickening complacency. Third, we are confronted with a definite choice. He's, this is the verse where he says, I counsel thee to go and do these things. Now, after church Wednesday night, Randy and I were talking about when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, and our conversation centered around the fact that Jesus came up before the tomb and said, Come forth! That's not what he said, was it? What did he say? Lazarus. Lazarus. Now, Bible scholars, and I can't really agree with it, said if he had just said, Come forth, the graveyard would have emptied out. And that's probably true. But virtually every time, and let's, let's just give, give me, let me give you one. Moses looked up on the mountain and saw a bush on fire and said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is on fire but not consumed. Watch this. And when God, I'm quoting the Bible, and when God saw that Moses turned aside to see. If Moses had been never turned aside to see, the story would have turned out entirely different, would it not? And when God saw that Moses turned aside to see, he spoke to Moses from the burning bush and said, anybody? Well, that's, that's yeah, but what, the first word out of his mouth, same as at the tomb, was Moses. Moses. When Adam sinned in the garden, what was the first word out of God's mouth? Adam. Virtually every time in the Bible when God speaks to a person, he calls them by a, a name. We talked about Wednesday night, Randy and I. He had no idea it's going to wind up. Be careful what you say to the preacher. It may wind up as a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> when God speaks to an individual, whether dead or alive, for the purpose of our study today, whether saved or unsaved, they will know exactly who it is. I first got under old time conviction as a 16 year old boy in a cottage prayer meeting. Didn't know nothing about the Bible, don't much, know much now. But I know who it was that was calling my name. How about you? I said, Oh, now he's acting like a stupid man. Living in sin. I knew who it was that was calling my name. I wish I had more time to stay on, on, on that point because there's a story there I'd really like to tell you, but let me move along. Some of you have heard me teach before that when God corrects, or the word used here in verse 19, 
chastens a person. In the Bible, he used three techniques. The first thing, I'll begin with the letter L. The first one is the look. That's what he used on Simon Peter. He didn't have to say a word. And Simon Peter went out and wept there. My girls, Amy's here, not in church, she'll be here in a little bit. We're going to see Becky. Both of them, when they was little, they tell you, well, by the time they was 11 or 12, I, I never did spank my youngins much. They may be different from that. <laughs> But they'd tell me, Jimmy, they'd tell me, Daddy, that brother, you just want me. There's the look. Secondly, there's the leading. This is not in your fill in the blank, but you'll write it down, it's okay. There's the look. There's the leading. We find this in the story of Isaiah. When I heard a voice behind me, me and Hector were talking yesterday afternoon about when the believer sins, you don't have to ask anybody whether that was sin or not, do you? I've told them before, I used to keep be raise beagle pups. And when one of them pups would mess up, they'd squirt back in the doghouse. That boy right back there, an old man now, when he was little, that's all it took to lock his heels. Not because I was mean. No, because I was his father. Wow, that freak. Isaiah said when I would turn to the right hand or to the left, what that reveals is even Isaiah got out of the way from time to time. We all sinned and kept short of the glory of God. Isaiah said, when I, I turned from the right hand to the left or to the left, I'd hear, no, he said, I'd hear a voice behind me saying, <coughs> I paraphrase. We see the look, the leading, I'm trying to get this done. We see the look, the leading, and then last of all, when can I tell you, it's his least favorite option. But when we become unresponsive, or when we become complacent, like these people were, satisfied with the status quo, he reserves the right to use the lash. And I tell folks, when God takes you out behind the woodshed, number one, you're going to know you've been out behind the woodshed. Somebody say amen. Number two, you're going to know who took you out behind the woodshed. And number three, you're going to know exactly why. In verse 19, he said, as many as I love. I'm glad he loves me and you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten to the believers of the land to see it. We would write this church off, but Jesus didn't. Do you notice that? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. First of all, they were called to renewal of spiritual values. There's much teaching here, but I just have to move. They were called to a renewal of spiritual values. You remember when I was the most important thing in your life. They were called to re a renewal of spiritual virtues. Oh, I've got a new slide. Thank you, baby. They were called to a renewal of spiritual values. They were called to a renewal of spiritual virtues. He said in Galatians 6, as you have therefore opportunity, let us do good, good. to all men, especially those who are of the household. Of faith. They were called to a renewal of spiritual values, a renewal of spiritual virtues, a renewal of spiritual vision. He said, Say not four months and then come at the harvest. I say unto you, Remember, look, the fields are white and the harvest. Pray ye therefore that the Lord will send laborers 
For the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers. We're talking about the days leading up to the rapture of the church. Fourthly, they were called a renewal of spiritual vitality. Peter said that we're to give all diligence. So in his final letter, I'm going to get done. I didn't know if I would or not, but I'm going to get done. In this final letter, which, by the way, is right before, in the scripture, the rapture of the church. But in this final letter, we see our dynamic Christ. God helped me to follow the dynamic Christ. And he said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. Help me to be a dynamic Christian. And in this final letter, we see our dynamic Christ. In stark contrast, we see a deluded church, a definite choice, and lastly, a dual challenge. First, there is a call to the sinner after they had drifted or complacent about it, he steals it. <laughs> this much. I on visitation. I on visitation. One, one night, me and Don Pickle were going up the sidewalk, and as we were walking up the sidewalk, somebody peeked through the Venetian blinds that way. I tell folks, it's usually not a good sign. <laughs> the door opened, it's on a little chain, some of you heard me tell the story. The door opened, a little chain caught it. Two little faces stuck through, stuck, stuck through the chain, through the uh, crack of the door. And we told them who we was, where we was from. Uh, the taller boy in the back said, Mama's sick. The little one in front said, Oh, she ain't. <laughs> Have you ever went to the door and you knew they was in there? This is the way I normally illustrate. It's probably this my computer is all painted. Uh, it's probably better illustrated. He knew they was in there. There's a call to the sinner. Last, the final word in the letters to the, church, to the seven churches was the call to the saints. He that hath ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Pray with you. Father, we thank you for what our ears have heard and our hearts have experienced throughout this study of the letter to the seven churches of Revelation. As we begin now the next great section of the book, as you have led us thus far, we pray that you would continue to lead, guide, and direct. Give us the humility, the grace, the meekness to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.